Since I began working with watercolors, somewhere around 12 to 18 months ago, I've painted and sold over 300 teeny tiny, itty bitty, mini watercolor landscapes, and I've learned a few things along the way. I'll be sharing my five tips to help you get started. Most of you are probably used to working on nine by 12 inch sheets of watercolor paper, but not me. My canvas is 1 12th of that size. I like to cut my paper down to three inch squares. And although these projects are small, it doesn't mean they're easy. My first tip is to consider using paper without heavy texture. On the right, we have a heavily textured paper by US Art Supply. In the center, Arches Cold Pressed, which is a lightly textured option. And on the left, Arches Hot Pressed, which is smooth without visible texture. I'm normally all for a rough textured paper, but let me show you what happens when we're painting on such a small scale. The texture is more noticeable than it would be on a large painting, and it can become distracting. Also, the grooves where the paint settles is more pronounced. Now I'll show you an example on the lightly textured cold pressed. This is my preferred choice. There's still a bit of that nice organic look that you get from textured paper, but it's more subtle. And this next one will be an example on the smooth hot pressed paper. See how the details are more crisp? The paint flows more freely and you can wind up with some really cool effects where the colors blend together. For these next two paintings, I did my best to create similar scenes. See if you can tell which one was painted on rough, heavily textured paper and which one was painted on smooth, hot pressed. Do you see the texture on the left? How about the crisp details on the right? And just a reminder, that lightly textured option that I like so much lands in between these two. Okay, let's jump right into tip number two. Make sure you have a variety of brush sizes. Have you ever painted an entire piece using just one brush? It can be a really fun challenge, but it's not as feasible when you're working on a three inch square. This is a set of standard size brushes. I believe the range is from size two to size 12. Now I'll show you a set that I purchased specifically for mini artwork. This set was actually marketed for use on models and miniature figurines, but it works great for my needs. I will mention that neither of these sets are expensive and they probably aren't considered professional grade, but I think they're perfect for beginners. I might invest in other brushes at some point, but I'm not there yet. And I'll have links in the description. This set includes a wide range of sizes for the pointed rounds, a few flat brushes, and some angled brushes. Take a look at the smallest tip. I don't use this one often, but it has come in handy a few times. Most often I'll use the angled dagger brush size one, the pointed round size zero, and then I'll pick out a third fine tipped round. The size will depend on how much detail I'm planning on adding. And then from the other set, I'll usually keep the size two and six on hand for the sky and the background. Tip number three, use water with care. Even on a small scale, we can create a variety of different looks. On the left, I've used the wet on wet method for a softer, looser effect. While on the right, I used mainly wet on dry for a more clean, precise look. What I'd like to do now is run through a quick side-by-side -side demo of each technique focusing on how water plays a major role in these small pieces. On the left, I'll be painting wet on wet, so I've already started by covering my entire paper with clean water. I'll include timestamps below in case you wanna skip ahead to the next step. I've added a quick sky to the right side, and it looks like the water has soaked in a bit on the left, so we're gonna do a sky on that side now. As I add the mountains, it'll become very clear why we should use care when adding water. On this small of a scale, each drop of paint spreads out over a proportionately large area of the scene. A little spreading doesn't mean much on a large surface, but look what it can mean on a three by three. Back to the right, as I add the mountains, the sky is still slightly wet, so we'll get some of the fading edges that I like for objects in the distance, but I'll have more control. And note that I'm actually having to drag the color down myself on this page, 
while on the left, the water did that part for me. Adding in the trees, we're immediately seeing some more of that bleeding. I would normally go a bit lighter for the background trees, but I know the reflection from the water can make it difficult to see on video, so I hope this will be noticeable enough. I'll be moving back to the right now, and I could wait for this layer to dry entirely, but I like the fade that we're going to get at the base of the trees. It kind of creates an illusion of mist. I know there's this huge rule out there in the watercolor community that you aren't supposed to paint into damp. Have you heard that before too? You can paint into wet, you can paint on top of dry, but damp is the big no-no. Well, I'm not sure I totally agree. I think that as long as you don't mess with your painting, you should be able to get away with adding one layer into your damp areas. I think the problems arise when you're either bringing in too much added water or fussing with your layers. I'd like to know in the comments if anyone agrees or if you stand by this rule of avoiding the damp at all costs. On the right, the paper is almost entirely dry already. So once I've added the grass and bushes, I'll actually be coming back in with a clean damp brush and softening those edges, especially the further I get to the back. There we go. See how that looks a little softer? I'd like to make sure these mountains have at least some structure, so I'm doing that now, just the hint of an outline at the top of the mountain range. I'll brush a little bit of paint on the right side as well, on top of our dry mountains. I'm realizing that I didn't leave much room for a tree in the foreground like I'd planned, so unfortunately these little guys are going to get covered up. Note how I've switched to a smaller brush and darker green for the closer trees. They'll have more detail than the background trees. Let's add another little tree on this side, about halfway back. The left side is still wet as we add the closer darker trees to this side as well. If I were to wait for the paper to dry, I could add more defined trees and grass here, but because the purpose of this demonstration is to show the effect of water on a small painting, I'm just going to keep working with the wet surface. and just touching in some final details here and there. I'll add a few birds in flight on each side, and then I think we can wrap this up. I don't think one way was necessarily better than the other. I think it's about what kind of look you prefer and what technique you're comfortable with. With both methods, we used water but we had to be aware of the differences in outcome when using different amounts of water on a mini painting as opposed to a regular size painting. Moving on to tip number four, edit your subject or scene. This is one I used to really struggle with. As you can see, I was guilty of trying to add more details than necessary and truly lacking any sort of understanding of focal points and composition. Your reference photo might have 100 trees, but that doesn't mean you're going to paint 100 trees. Now let's take a look at some of my more recent work. See the far off trees in the distance? I'm getting better about letting my backgrounds fade away. Here I'm creating the illusion of a forest of trees rather than trying to paint an entire forest of trees. I know I still have so much more to learn in this area, but compared to the previous four landscapes that we looked at, I can see how my art is improving. I contribute a lot of that to editing. When it comes to being able to simplify a landscape, I've noticed myself turning to another form of editing. 
I think of this approach as consolidation. If you look closely at this field of flowers, you'll see that I only painted a few flowers in the immediate foreground. The rest of the field is nothing more than the appropriate colors coming together to look like a bunch of flowers. And in this second example, the green foliage was created as a mass instead of individual plants and leaves. In fact, I let my brush hop along the page, barely lifting it from the paper. We can still view this painting and know that we're looking at plants and shrubs, regardless of the fact that they've been consolidated into one cluster. Now, I'm going to challenge myself to paint a second version of a cabin. My plan is to edit out unnecessary details, to consolidate where applicable, and to do away with fine details, unless those details are part of the foreground. When we look at something far away, the edges are somewhat blurry and the fine details aren't visible, so it didn't make sense for me to worry about individual tree branches or wooden planks on a cabin when those items are so far off in the distance. As I work, I'm going to chat about a bonus tip. This was something I thought of while I was filming. It's a piece of advice that I myself would benefit from greatly yet I have such a difficult time putting this into practice. The bonus tip is start with a plan and a basic sketch. I'm not sure why I'm so inclined to jump right into a project head first without throwing a few pencil lines down on the paper. Logically, I know that paintings have a better chance of success when you begin with an outline, but it's often something that doesn't cross my mind until I'm well into the process. So this is a tip I'll be actively working on. On a small scale, this could mean just putting in a horizon line and maybe the indication of where the trees will go. This actually reminds me of something pertaining to novel writing. Have you heard the terms plotters and pantsers? Plotters outline and plan out the details of their book beforehand, including the main plot beats and sometimes even down to the individual scenes. Pantsers, on the other hand, are known for flying by the seat of their pants. They will jump into a story without knowing the beats or even the ending and just see where the story takes them. So whether or not you sketch first is sort of like the artist's version of plotters versus pantsers. Those who sketch first and those who reach for the paintbrush straight away. I like the excitement of the second option, I have to say. But I do think in some cases we can all benefit from a touch of planning. Well, I personally like the cabin on the right better, the more simplified, edited version. What do you think? It's time for the final tip when it comes to painting mini watercolor landscapes. Number five, consider using a limited color palette. Again, I'm using some of my older pieces to demonstrate what didn't work. These are three examples of how too many colors can make the small space feel crowded and busy. I mean, did I really need to use so many different greens? Instead of adding depth like I'd hoped, it just looks chaotic. Now, I'm certainly not encouraging you to shy away from color, but rather to choose maybe three to five colors and work on varying your values instead of pulling in more color. Here's a recent set that I painted using only a small handful of color options. I'm still using bright, fun colors, but in a way that doesn't feel as jumbled. In this third picture, imagine if I'd added some flowers to the foreground. Try to picture red flowers, blue flowers, magenta. It would feel like too much, wouldn't it? Now what if I had used an existing color from this palette and varied the value instead? Picture flowers in a darker version of the violet from the mountains. Now that would work. Of course, color theory is another area that I need to learn more about, but this side-by-side -side is a good example of how simplifying your palette can be helpful with these extra small canvases. Okay, to review, the five tips were, consider a paper without heavy texture, have a variety of brushes, use water with care, edit your scene, simplify your palette, and the bonus tip was to start with a quick sketch. As we end today's video, you be the judge. Which of my mini watercolor landscapes were successful? And which ones did I clearly jump into with none of my own advice in mind? I hope you'll visit my short intro video in the description to see if you'd like to subscribe to this channel. If it looks like a good fit, 
I'd love to have you here. Thanks so much for watching.